Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight into crew at the college level. My guest today is Marty Crardy, and he is the uh, men's crew coach at Princeton University, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So where'd you go to school? I went to Princeton. Ah. graduated class in 98. All right, great. So let's just go back a little bit in time. Um, let's go into high school. When did you start thinking about going to college? Was it freshman year of co uh, high school, senior year of high school? When did it all begin for you? Probably freshman and sophomore year. I mean, I knew, I knew that I wanted to go to college. And uh, I was a fan of a lot of sports. So mainly just my exposure to where I might want to go to college was what I saw on TV. Okay. Um, I started, I didn't start rowing until late in my junior year of high school. So that's when it, my focus turned more toward rowing schools. Okay. And um, that's when it got a little bit more focused. Now, you, did your mom and dad get involved in, in the whole process? How did, uh, how did you end up picking Princeton as, as the university? Was it the only uni university you applied to? Uh, no, I, I applied, unlike what they're doing now, I applied to probably seven or eight different places. And I didn't make my decision until April 30th of my <laughs> senior year. Wow. Um, which is kind of unheard of now. But uh, I was so new to rowing that I had so much to learn about the sport as well. Even though I was progressing through the sport pretty rapidly, I had so much to learn. And so it took me a while to talk to the, talk to the different coaches, learn about the team, see what might be a good fit for me. I had a cousin who was at Princeton, um, and also an old high school teammate or somebody who went to my high school who helped me through the process with Princeton. And as I became more familiar with Princeton and more familiar with them, I, I felt the most comfortable with oh. this place. So now you, you go to Princeton University. What's the school like as a student? What, do you, what, do you, what did you do when you got there? Uh, I just dove right in and um, the school as a student is just a tremendous place um, you know it starts with it starts with the open stacks of Firestone Library um, to be able to just walk down there and pretty much explore whatever you want to without any restrictions um, I never knew that I would take so much advantage of it but once your courses kind of dictate what you have to do in Firestone I I really started liking that aspect of Princeton. Um, the classes, uh, we had something called distribution requirements, and not to bore anybody, but um, those distribution requirements and having to fulfill them, I think there were six or seven areas of the curriculum that we had to cover okay. freshman and sophomore year before we moved on to our major. That was a nice, broad-based kind of... Um, Every day just was a good uh, mix of different types of courses. You weren't just doing one thing every day. Uh, and cool. so I, I enjoyed that aspect of the curriculum as well. So as so, a student, it was, um, it was fun. Freshman and sophomore year, um, once you learned what they were looking for, once, you're, once you learned what your professors were looking for in, in your writing or in your, you know, the way you just sit down and take an exam, um, this place became pretty fun as a scholar, as a student athlete, yeah. Great. So now you graduate from Princeton. How does one graduate from Princeton University to become the men's crew coach at Princeton <laughs> University? Uh, by accident and um, by, the, by the blessing of my former rowing coach, uh, Curtis Jordan, actually. But I... Um, I went to Oxford after I graduated, and I did some studies over there. Um, I rode in a, something called the boat race hmm. um, between Oxford and Cambridge. It's a big deal over there. It's sort of uh, the one chance you get to probably feel what it feels like to be like the quarterback of Alabama or something <laughs> like that. Um, but for, for a fleeting moment in March of 1999, um, I was part of a crew that... Uh, this boat race is kind of a big deal over there. I also really enjoyed my studies over at Oxford. I wrote another thesis and did various things like that. Wow. When I got back, I took a swing at making the national team. The national team was training here. Um, 
and I had been on a couple national teams before I graduated, but uh, as you get closer and closer to the Olympics, it gets harder and harder to make teams. And I, I was uh, unsuccessful in making the Sydney Olympic team. And I just wanted to take a break from rowing for a little bit. Uh, so I moved out to Chicago. Hmm. And um, I was following my wife, who was going to University of Chicago Law School out there. She wasn't my wife yet. But I did a lap around the white collar world and worked down in the loop and worked in finance for a little bit with Merrill Lynch. Wow. And um, then we came back in 2003, four, and started our life here. Long story short, Curtis Jordan called me up and asked me if I wanted to be his assistant coach. And I, I thought it would be a, a, a fun idea. <laughs> and um, that's, when, that's when my collegiate coaching career got started. So, huh, so you had a whole career before the career. I had a career. I mean, I was a mid twenty year old guy getting into finance, and um, it's it, it it was it was fun. I really I actually really liked the company Merrill Lynch, um, and they have roots in Princeton too. So maybe it was that. Maybe it was. Um, I, I don't know what it, it was. A good collegial atmosphere. I, I didn't I didn't mind it. Yeah. But when Curtis called and. He convinced me that at least given coaching at the collegiate level, a crack would be a good idea. I agreed. So you went from assistant and then, I guess, Curtis retired? Yeah. Uh, nobody expected it at the time. Um, but Curtis retired uh, in May of 2009. And um, that uh, vacated his job. His job was taken by the, the lightweight coach, the then lightweight coach. And then that's when I ascended into that lightweight head coaching job, where, gotcha. where I'm still am ten years later. Great. So um, let's get into crew. What is it? How does it work? What type of uh, students do you look for? Uh, <laughs> do you want to ask me a more specific question? Uh, <laughs> rowing is um, rowing is not a game. Um, we all love games. We all love watching the scoreboard and seeing who's in the lead. And rowing's, uh, rowing's work. And um, it's, it's, uh, it, takes places in, it takes place in boats. Um, you line them up side by side and, and uh, the fastest boat wins. But it takes, it takes an incredible amount of coordination um, for not only the, the individual, but the individuals working together. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the cliches kind of come from. Um, and how many people are on looks, a boat? It looks easy, but I would say in terms of just a total body kind of exertion, exercise, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do when you're doing it, when you're doing it well. You can actually row really poorly and it's not that hard. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but when you're doing it really well and you're you're really rowing a full stroke very efficiently, it's it's very difficult. And how many people are on a boat? Um, well, in college we race eights, so there's eight oarsmen and one coxswain. And in our in the, on the men's side of things, that coxswain can be either a male or a female. Where all the people in men's rowing, it has to be male. But it's uh, so we row eights. But we also practice in fours, and we practice in pairs, we practice in singles. But no more than eight. No more than eight oarsmen in one boat. Now, uh, it's been told to me that uh, crew, everyone tries to be the same weight, the same height, so, so the rowing is all seamless? So my, my category of men's lightweight rowing varies with men's heavyweight rowing. Um, men's heavyweight rowing, you can be any size, any weight, any height, any weight, um, it's, it's open. In men's lightweight rowing, you can only be a maximum of 160 pounds. Wow. And so if you're more than 6'2 or 6'3, that becomes pretty difficult. It, it Just because of the weight component, uh, most of my oarsmen are between 5'10 and 6'1. Hmm. Um, it's just kind of that size and frame we're looking for guys who are tall but lean um, strong but skinny um, yeah. and ma mainly you know getting back to just the the work aspect of the sport it's people who are 
kind of self-driven just by doing work and getting the most out of themselves and actually having such a kind of a weird a weird liking for doing the work and um, really exerting themselves to the point of exhaustion it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting Cause it, in people's DNA. Because <laughs> it's it's all the muscles that you're using, yeah. right? You're using your legs, your arms, everything, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so so, where do you find your people to row? So, since I uh, was kind of a high school rowing recruit in 1993, um, rowing, if anything, has increased exponentially across the United States and, and and also in the world and just your access to the international athletes as well has become much easier so we we recruit and we look for athletes on the entire globe everywhere wow. from New Zealand all the way um, to down the street over wow. at Mercer Rowing Club um, we uh, we have access to all the junior rowing programs in the United States and in the world. Um, they have a they have a nice uh, kind of network of high class rowing regattas and events, mm -hmm. um, regional championships, national championships, international championships, which were just held in Tokyo. Actually, the World Championships of Junior Rowing. And you go to these things to watch everybody. Yep, and you know it doesn't. It doesn't take a genius to, you know it when you see it, and then there's also the, the paper trial to back it up in terms of individual ability, individual capacity, uh, and then when it comes to a place like Princeton, you know, that is followed very closely by transcripts and SAT scores and ACT right. scores and things like that. So other than the grades right now, um, what type of athletes are good for crew? Uh, people who don't mind hard work, uh, people who are physically big, fit, uh, they physically big. fit. People who people who like to train. Um, it's people who like to wake up early in the morning. I hear um, you have to get up at five o'clock to go. Do yeah, this. you know, some places they really have to. Uh, they row on waterways that are um, through waterways for for boats and barges <laughs> and. Um, all sorts of things. So in order to kind of avoid that, they've got to get up early. Or, you know, rowing is really difficult when the water is choppy. So before the wind kicks up, mm -hmm. um, it's always nice to go out there and row and, you know, make fresh tracks, if you will. Um, it's always good to get out there before the wind kicks up and the water's nice and flat. Um, at a place like Princeton, we don't have to row in the morning if we don't want to. Uh, we have a nice, we have a beautiful body of water down there in Lake Carnegie that's mm -hmm. always flat and it's only for Princeton rowers. It's great. So it's kind of an amazing place to row. Um, but yeah, the, the morning thing, it's kind of, some places it's true, but a lot of colleges and universities, you don't have to get up too, too early. It's not, it's not crazy. So now a freshman coming to Princeton University, um, what can a freshman uh, rower look at what's the year like when do they get to school what happens in the fall what happens in the spring sure how does crew work for the year at princeton university sure the uh the season our our recognized season is from february 1st to about june 1st which is our national championships in the first weekend of june um and just going back from there <clears throat> we uh we don't require that you get to school early or anything like that. It's 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 kind of a spring sport, uh, but we do we do train all year round for rowing. Um, but we don't have our first practice until the second or third day of school, hmm. second or third day of classes. Um, we start off uh, just making sure guys come back to school in shape enough to get in better shape. <laughs> Um, it's very hard to kind of come back if you're just a total couch potato over the summer. <laughs> so if you're in shape to get in shape, that's a good start. We don't want you to come back in top form. It's really, really hard to stay in peak form for nine or ten months. Sure. Uh, and then we kind of just build it up. We have some competitions in the fall. We go up to Boston for the annual Head of the Charles Regatta. Everybody's heard of that. Um, we've done very well at Head of Charles the last decade or so. 
Um, but it's not, you know, ahead of the Charles as fun and fun as it is, and the parents like it, and the kids like it, and it's not an it's not an official event. Mm -hmm. They don't hand out any national championships based on your performance at Head of the Charles. Uh, we have a nice regatta here called the Princeton Chase the following week. Um, everybody from our league and elsewhere hmm. comes to Lake Carnegie and rows in a, in a race in the fall. And, you know, the fall is just kind of like a, it's, uh, you know, you've got some new freshmen you're incorporating into your program. You can t take a look at them, see how they're, see how they're going to do yeah. uh, in the spring. You can get some ideas for the spring. But after the Princeton Chase, we go back indoors from mid-November to, uh, end of January, which is when we go on a training trip. Most colleges go on a go on a winter training trip down south somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when you get back from your winter training trip, it's it's time to go. Your first race is third or fourth weekend of March. And then you race every single weekend between the last weekend of March and, and June and the first weekend of June. So in the winter time is it just uh, working working out and and yeah. working on rowing skills and things of that sort? Yeah, we use uh, we use uh, a device called the ergometer, which is your standard rowing machine, which you've seen in most health clubs or hotel fitness rooms yeah. or things like that. And if you've ever been to the Princeton Boathouse, you've we have hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> we have enough for everybody, which a lot of kids wish we probably didn't have as many. But uh, there's one for everybody, and we spend a lot of time on the rowing machine. The rowing machine has a computerized uh, basically it measures the work you're doing mm -hmm. um, and so we can get very 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 dialed into the training they're doing wow. make sure we don't train them too hard but make sure they're training hard enough so that they're going to be ready for the rigors of the spring racing season so now a high school student um, does he do uh, regattas uh, does he do just high school rowing does he do um, other things. How, how does how does he get noticed by a school like Princeton University? Sure, you you don't have to only row to to get noticed by us. Um, you can play other sports. Um, more and more kids are only rowing. They're rowing in the fall and the spring, and they're training in the winter, kind of like in college. Uh, we still get two or three sport athletes. That's fine. Um, through the ergometer it's very easy to measure individual capacity. So there's a standard test we do, which is 2,000 meter ergometer piece. Hmm. And it takes about six and a half minutes, six, six minutes, 15 seconds, somewhere in there. The lower the, be the, lower the better. Um, so you can just tell that a person has you know, capacity if they're able to achieve a certain score. Oh. The erg doesn't lie, there's no way to bluff it, there's no way to fake it. So that's one measurement tool we use. The other measurement tool we use are just our eyes. Mm -hmm. Just like anybody would do in any other sport, there's a subjective, there's a subjectivity where you can kind of just see the way a guy moves in a boat, so you can do that via video or you can do that just live in person. We try to get around and spend time in high school coaches' motorboats mm -hmm. so we can get an up close and personal look at just the way the kid rose. And is there, is there certain uh, regattas that you go to that, that see a, a bunch of high school students? Yeah, there's, there's great catch-all regattas like U.S. Nat Nationals, and then there's, gosh, I think there's like 11 regional regattas where you qualify for those nationals. So oh. it, the interesting thing is all of those regional and national regattas coincide with our season. So... It's really hard to make it to all the regional regattas, but most coaches will make it to the national regatta. And again, um, it's a good catch-all, but if you're not at that regatta, again, that doesn't, that doesn't um, now, preclude you from being recruited. It just means you're, you weren't on a team that was good enough to make nationals. And making nationals and doing well at nationals... I think U.S. Rowing has done an awesome job of setting up the qualifica qualification criteria. If you're at nationals, you've probably done some good stuff that season. So oh. naturally, it's just going to draw our attention. And then we're really looking for the people who perform well at nationals, um, especially from programs that maybe haven't fared well in the past. 
and they're kind of coming out of coming out of nowhere to do well at nationals. That's probably a really good thing for the people rowing in that boat. They're going to get noticed. Now, parents talk about film. Um, do they film the whole uh, meet? Do they film yep. just a portion? Do they film the end, the beginning? How does it, how does a college coach look for in what type of film? Yeah, because it's over a mile and a quarter, two thousand meters. The races are two thousand meters. That's the Olympic distance. Uh, that's a lot of ground to cover with a camera, but they actually have, you know, wireless um, drones. No, what? Well, <laughs> they do have drones now. Actually, in the last couple of years, the drone footage of regattas has become. I bet very professionalized and it's amazing it's really revolutionized the way people watch rowing watching rowing is actually more interesting because they don't just have fixed cameras every 500 meters or something yeah. like that they can also put cameras in motor boats moving alongside uh. with with rowing like if you've ever seen you know the the cameras on tracks um just on the rails as this as the sprinters do the 100 meter dash or yeah. if the milers kind of finishing up in the last straightaway or something like that that's a really cool view they have that in rowing now it's not on tracks but it's in boats wow so if you're resourceful enough which you don't have to be very resourceful now you can watch any rower who was in the grand final of any event wow. at nationals you can pretty much get a good one or two minutes snippet of that rower and does it or or just from practice and does it matter where I sit in the boat to get recognized? Can I be number one rower or number eight rower? You can, yeah. Anywhere in the boat, if we're able to watch you for one or two minutes on video, like we can get a pretty good idea of what you're, what you're doing right or how you move or how athletic you might be or what you're doing wrong. So now compared to other schools, Princeton is a very highly academic school. Yeah. Um, so the grades have to be there, right? Absolutely. Um, what What are some of the grades that they look at? Is it a 3.5 GPA, a 4.0? You've got to be the number one in your class to even get on the road team? Um, I think that uh, the, the body of work, I would say, you have to have proof that you're able to, you're able to get here and, and do the work mm -hmm. and that you're an organized, diligent student. I, said, I would say the... The big don'ts are a transcript that's really choppy. It might average out to 3.5, but if it's A, C, A, C, A, C, A, C, hmm. that's not going to work. Um, you know, inconsistency from year to year, inconsistency from semester to semester. That's, you know, if, if you can, sh through your recommendations and your transcript, and things that kind of show consistency and reliability and diligence and organization, those are the things that are most important when it comes to being a student athlete in college. Yeah. Um, people who aren't or people who can't fend for themselves and kind of work independently, it, it, it's people who need, people who need hand-holding, it, it, it's a problem and it becomes evident very early in their freshman year from from coach to athlete So now someone who's interested in going to Princeton University that they just go to the website fill out some kind of questionnaire on the website Is that how it works? Yeah, most of the I know the rowing site does so you go to go Princeton Tigers .com and you click on rowing and um, It'll have men's lightweight men's heavyweight women's open weight women's lightweight It'll have it all right there <clears throat> and each 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 team and then each sport as well on the website has has a questionnaire that you can fill out. Fill out the questionnaire, and if we're doing our job, we'll most likely get back to you um, relatively quickly. If you don't hear back from us, it might be because you're a sophomore and we can't respond to you yet, or something like that. And all this, I'm not even going to get into it. As you know, all the sports have different dates and different rules. So right. Um, and even women's rowing are, have different rules than men's rowing. So without even getting into that, there might be a reason why we're not able to get back to you. There might be a reason why we're just not getting back to you because we're traveling and we're on a 10-day recruiting trip or something like that. So just kind of keep, stay in close contact and um, show interest in Princeton and, and we'll eventually get back to you and strike up a conversation. And if the credentials are there, then obviously that conversation is going to be more frequent. Right.
and it just it moves it moves the the process quicker right. as they get there. Right. Great. Well, we're coming to the end of our show, and uh, already wow. Yeah. See, thirty minutes goes quick, right? Sure. Um, so usually I ask my guests, uh, what advice do you want to give to the parents, the, the their sons, even the daughters that that are trying to get into crew and want to go to college to do it? What advice do you want to give them? Well, like I said at the beginning, rowing is not a game. So, like, you have to have a you have to have um, kind of a unique desire to to do work and get gratification out of that. At the end of the day, there's no stats or anything that make you feel better. You can you can monitor your improvement. You can track your improvement. Like I said, with with the rowing machine, and that that. Uh, that can measure the amount of work you're doing over a certain time and distance. But it's not a game, so you have to like rowing. You have to, be, you have to like being out on the water. You have to like the aspect of having to work with your teammates in order for a, a, a boat to go, you know, and, and win. Um, for the parents, in terms of the college admissions process and how that applies to rowing, Guide them. Um, I mean, every 17-year-old needs a kick in the butt every once in a while to get moving on applications or emails or, or showing interest in certain schools. Guide them, but don't run the process for them. Um, I like communicating one-on-one -on -one with, with the juniors and seniors in high school. I don't like communicating with parents about the college admissions process. It's, it's their children that are applying to college. So do not do your communication for your son or daughter. Um, let them do it Correct. while you might be guiding them in the background with kind of what to do and how to do it and when to do it, things like that. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time. Mm -hmm.